Hello friends, in continuation of my talk on catheter associated urinary tract infection, POTI, in this uh, video I am talking to you about how does COTI progress within the urinary tract. Having occurred once, what will happen? How will it progress over a period of time? What is the natural history of COTI in patients? You should know the fundamental. Once you place a uthal catheter in anyone's urinary tract, it is regarded as a foreign body. It is not natural. So, human body will react against it, which is quite understandable. And it can react in various ways. One way is COTI. How does COTI progress within the human body? Infection will first occur inside the lower urinary tract, which means bladder and urethra. And from there, infection can either move on into the upper urinary tract, the ureter and kidneys, or it can move inside the male accessory glands which are present around the urethra and the prostate and some angina vesicles. So, the progression can happen in two territories. If the infection progresses beyond a limit in either of the territory, upper urinary tract or the male glands, it can result into septicemia and it can be a reason of urosepsis. And that is why cortic can be a fatal infection. Let me explain to you firstly the spread of infection in low urinary tract. By that I mean spread of infection in urethra, um, spread of infection in the bladder. In urethra, the normal urethra is a conduit for the flow of urine and for the flow of semen. It is not used to having an occluding mechanism like a catheter shaft. If one places a catheter in the lumen of urethra, which occupies a substantial space in it, then the urethra will react and irritation will happen and infection can develop. Same way in bladder, the tip of the catheter will rub against the mucosa and will cause mucosal reaction. And not only the mucosa will get edematous, but the underlying bladder wall can become edematous and over a period of time that segment of the bladder wall which is in touch with the catheter gets uh, abnormal right? and these are what is called post inflammatory fibrotic changes may take place in the bladder wall. The mucosa becomes more permeable to bacteria, more permeable to urine, it loses its GAG layer, so many small things happen. And that patch of the bladder wall becomes more vulnerable to the extension of infection within the bladder wall. Moving to the spread of infection in periurethral accessory glands. In the glands are located in anterior urethra and the glands are also located in the posterior urethra and this is I am talking in reference to males. In anterior urethra, the infection will first of all go in litter glands and initially it remains in a non superative stage, which means a periurethral adenitis will take place. If a number of glands are involved, a patch of the, the glands are involved, this will result in what's called periurethral phlegmon formation. And if it goes undetected, untreated, this will move on to a suppurative stage, whereby I mean a formation of pus. And patient will develop periurethral abscess and a periurethral fistula in some patients. Here is an example of a patient who has an indwelling catheter in the urethra and he has developed a periurethral abscess. The commonest site is penoscrotal junction. 
And once this abscess develops, patient complains of painful swelling in the perineum and fever. And if, it, if you're not careful about it, you don't treat it in time, this will rupture outside and a patient will develop formation of a urethrocutaneous fistula. In posterior urethra, there are more glands. You can have infection ascending into the seminal vesicles, a condition known as seminal vesiculitis, and patient can develop you know, pyospermia, the pus in the semen, or even hematospermia. The infection can move into the epididymis of the testis, one or both sides, and will develop epididymoarchitis. In some patients, this epididymoarchitis can even go to a superative stage and pus forms and entire thing gets destroyed. In another patient, you can have infection spread into prostate, what's known as focal non-superative prostatitis initially, a patch of prostate gland is involved, later on even abscess in the prostate can form. So, given in a patient, depending upon his body's immune status, depending upon so many factors related to catheter and his own body, medication, disease. You can have infection in one of these glands, two of these glands, all three of them. In spinal vesicles, this catheter which lies in the prostatic urethra, the shaft of the catheter blocks the ejaculatory ducts. That is why the drainage of spinal vesicles gets impeded. And in this impeded drainage, you can have growth of bacteria and this the collection inside the seminal vesicle becomes purulent, what's known as pyospermia. In other patients, they can be bleeding from the mucosal wall of the seminal vesicle by what I mean by hematospermia. So this is one consequence of having a catheter in the prostatic urethra. The other is the prostatic ducts can get blocked by the shaft of the catheter and you can either get focal prostatitis which is non-superative condition and if it stays longer, it will become an abscess in the prostate. And I have seen large number of diabetic males who remain on catheter and they develop prostatic abscesses. In epididymis, I said earlier, you can get a unilateral or bilateral epididymorchitis. It can be again non-superative and superative depending upon how long it has stayed in the body. So, the third is spread of infection in the upper urinary tract. And this is spread into ureters and spread into kidneys. One reason of occurrence of infection in the ureter is that in some patients, the tip of the Foley catheter can directly block the ureteric orifice. In fact, it, I have seen it into susceptible into the ureteric orifice and occluding, obturating the ureteric orifice resulting into obstructed drainage of the ureter and then infection in that ureter. So the catheter can obstruct the ureteric drainage. More common is when the tip irritates the orifice and mucosa around the ureteric orifice, periorificial bladder wall, the mucosa becomes edematous as shown here. And because of edema of the mucosa, the, the compliance, the, the ability of the ureteric orifice to collapse and open becomes tardy. The process becomes slow. See, I can move my finger like this quickly, 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 quickly. But if it is inflamed and edematous, the speed of movement of my finger will be slow. In the same manner, the occlusion of orifice and opening of the orifice becomes a tardy process. Right? So, in, and while it is open, at that time the reflux can take place into the ureter. And see, I told you that those patients who remain on catheter, in the perivalloon space, there is a urine which is contaminated by bacteria where large number of bacteria are already present. And if this patient has a bladder spasm, this urine in the perivalloon space, part of it will go, of course, outside by pericatheter leakage. But if the ureteric orifice is dilated and if the, the functional capability of ureteric orifices are, are compromised, 
some urine will reflux up into the ureter and this is infected urine and this will lead to hydrourethral nephrosis and the bacteria which are often resistant to many antibiotics will find way in the kidneys to cause really uh, sinister pyelonephritis. The fourth is the spread of infection in the rest of the body. And this can happen from kidneys, the pyelonephritis, the renal abscesses can lead to a spread of infection in the rest of the body or this can also happen from epidermal abscess and prostatic abscess. It can be a metastatic infection. The patient had epidemorchitis superative and he also had pneumonia because of blood borne metastasis of bacterial inoculum. Or this could be a frank urosepsis where the patient goes in a state of septicemic shock and who is really battling with his life and survival. So I hope you understood that the corti which begins from a catheter, it then moves on into urethra, into bladder, it can move on into ureter and kidneys, it can move on inside the accessory glands and it can move on inside the whole body and give rise to permanent infection. Thank you very much for your patient time. If you have any questions about this, you can uh, post it on my email drdalila24 at gmail.com or you can see more videos related to this on the Lila Academy of Urology. Thank you very much.